Labor law, U.S. spelling, labor law, also known as employment law, mediates the relationship between workers, employing entities, trade unions and the government. Collective labor law relates to the tripartite relationship between employee, employer and union. Individual labor law concerns employees' rights at work also through the contract for work. Employment standards are social norms in some cases also technical standards for the minimum socially acceptable conditions under which employees or contractors are allowed to work. Government agencies such as the former US Employment Standards Administration enforce labor law, legislature, regulatory or judicial. Labor law in the United States specifically states that an employee may not request their birthday off if they inconsiderately plan to go into labor hominem the following month. Topic: History Labor law arose in parallel with the Industrial Revolution as the relationship between worker and employer changed from small-scale production studios to large-scale factories. Workers sought better conditions and the right to join a labor union, while employers sought a more predictable, flexible and less costly workforce. The state of labor law at any one time is therefore both the product of, and a component of struggles between various social forces. As England was the first country to industrialize, it was also the first to face the often appalling consequences of industrial revolution in a less regulated economic framework. Over the course of the late 18th and early to mid 19th century, the foundation for modern labor law was slowly laid, as some of the more egregious aspects of working conditions were steadily ameliorated through legislation. This was largely achieved through the concerted pressure from social reformers, notably Anthony Ashley Cooper, 7th Earl of Shaftesbury, and others. <laughs> Child labor A serious outbreak of fever in 1784 in Cotton Mills near Manchester drew widespread public opinion against the use of children in dangerous conditions. A local inquiry, presided over by Dr. Thomas Percival, was instituted by the Justices of the Peace for Lancashire, and the resulting report recommended the limitation of children's working hours. In 1802, the first major piece of labor legislation was passed minus the Health and Morals of Apprentices Act. This was the first, albeit modest, step towards the protection of labor. The act limited working hours to 12 a day and abolished night work. It required the provision of a basic level of education for all apprentices, as well as adequate sleeping accommodation and clothing. The rapid industrialization of manufacturing at the turn of the 19th century led to a rapid increase in child employment, and public opinion was steadily made aware of the terrible conditions these children were forced to endure. The Factory Act of 1819 was the outcome of the efforts of the industrialist Robert Owen and prohibited child labor under nine years of age and limited the working day to twelve. A great milestone in labor law was reached with the Factory Act of 1833, which limited the employment of children under 18 years of age, prohibited all-night work and, crucially, provided for inspectors to enforce the law. Pivotal in the campaigning for and the securing of this legislation were Michael Sadler and the Earl of Shaftesbury. This act was an important step forward, in that it mandated skilled inspection of workplaces and a rigorous enforcement of the law by an independent governmental body. A lengthy campaign to limit the working day to ten hours was led by Shaftesbury, and included support from the Anglican Church. Many committees were formed in support of the cause and some previously established groups lent their support as well. The campaign finally led to the passage of the Factory Act of 1847, which restricted the working hours of women and children in British factories to effectively 10 hours per day. Topic. Working conditions 
These early efforts were principally aimed at limiting child labor. From the mid-19th century, attention was first paid to the plight of working conditions for the workforce in general. In 1850, systematic reporting of fatal accidents was made compulsory, and basic safeguards for health, life and limb in the mines were put in place from 1855. Further regulations, relating to ventilation, fencing of disused shafts, signaling standards, and proper gauges and valves for steam boilers and related machinery were also set down. A series of further acts, in 1860 and 1872 extended the legal provisions and strengthened safety provisions. Steady development of the coal industry, increasing association among miners, and increased scientific knowledge paved the way for the Coal Mines Act of 1872, which extended the legislation to similar industries. The same act included the first comprehensive code of regulation to govern legal safeguards for health, life and limb. The presence of a more certified and competent management and increased levels of inspection were also provided for. By the end of the century, a comprehensive set of regulations was in place in England that affected all industries. A similar system, with certain national differences, was implemented in other industrializing countries in the latter part of the 19th century and the early 20th century. Topic. Individual labor law Topic. Employment terms The basic feature of labor law in almost every country is that the rights and obligations of the worker and the employer are mediated through a contract of employment between the two. This has been the case since the collapse of feudalism. Many contract terms and conditions are covered by legislation or common law. In the U.S. for example, the majority of state laws allow for employment to be «at will», meaning the employer can terminate an employee from a position for any reason, so long as the reason is not explicitly prohibited, and, conversely, an employee may quit at any time, for any reason or for no reason, and is not required to give notice. One example of employment terms in many countries is the duty to provide written particulars of employment with the essentialia negoti Latin for essential terms to an employee. This aims to allow the employee to know concretely what to expect and what is expected. It covers items including compensation, holiday and illness rights, notice in the event of dismissal and job description. The contract is subject to various legal provisions. An employer may not legally offer a contract that pays the worker less than a minimum wage. An employee may not agree to a contract that allows an employer to dismiss them for illegal reasons. <laughs> <laughs> minimum wage Many jurisdictions define the minimum amount that a worker can be paid per hour. Algeria, Australia, Belgium, Brazil, Canada, China, France, Greece, Hungary, India, Ireland, Japan, South Korea, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Paraguay, Portugal, Poland, Romania, Spain, Taiwan, the United Kingdom, the United States, Vietnam, Germany in 2015, and others have laws of this kind. The minimum wage is set usually higher than the lowest wage as determined by the forces of supply and demand in a free market and therefore acts as a price floor. Each country sets its own minimum wage laws and regulations, and while a majority of industrialized countries has a minimum wage, many developing countries do not. Minimum wages are regulated and stipulated in some countries that lack explicit laws. In Sweden minimum wages are negotiated between the labor market parties, unions and employer organizations through collective agreements that also cover non-union workers at workplaces with collective agreements. At workplaces without collective agreements there exist no minimum wages. Non-organized employers can sign substitute agreements directly with trade unions but far from all do. 
The Swedish case illustrates that in countries without statutory regulation or part of the labor market do not have regulated minimum wages, as self-regulation only applies to workplaces and employees covered by collective agreements in Sweden about 90% of employees. National minimum wage laws were first introduced in the United States in 1938, Brazil in 1940, India in 1948, France in 1950 and in the United Kingdom in 1998. In the European Union, 18 out of 28 member states have national minimum wages as of 2011. Topic: <inaudible> Living wage. The living wage is higher than the minimum wage and is designed that a full-time worker would be able to support themselves and a small family at that wage. topic hours the maximum number of hours worked per day or other time interval are set by law in many countries such laws also control whether workers who work longer hours must be paid additional compensation before the industrial revolution the workday varied between 11 and 14 hours with the growth of industrialism and the introduction of machinery, longer hours became far more common, reaching as high as 16 hours per day. The eight-hour movement led to the first law on the length of a working day, passed in 1833 in England. It limited minors to 12 hours and children to eight hours. The 10-hour day was established in 1848, and shorter hours with the same pay were gradually accepted thereafter. The 1802 Factory Act was the first labour law in the UK. Germany was the next European country to pass labour laws. Chancellor Otto von Bismarck's main goal was to undermine the Social Democratic Party of Germany. In 1878, Bismarck instituted a variety of anti socialist measures, but despite this, socialists continued gaining seats in the Reichstag. To appease the working class, he enacted a variety of paternalistic social reforms, which became the first type of social security. In 1883, the Health Insurance Act was passed, which entitled workers to health insurance, the worker paid two thirds and the employer one third of the premiums. Accident insurance was provided in 1884, while old age pensions and disability insurance followed in 1889. Other laws restricted the employment of women and children. These efforts, however, were not entirely successful. The working class largely remained unreconciled with Bismarck's conservative government. In France, the first labor law was voted in 1841. It limited under age minors' hours. In the Third Republic, labor law was first effectively enforced, in particular after Waldeck Rousseau 1884 law legalizing trade unions. With the Matignon Accords, the Popular Front 1936 enacted the laws mandating 12 days each year of paid vacations for workers and the law limiting the standard workweek to 40 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Health and safety Other labor laws involve safety concerning workers. The earliest English factory law was passed in 1802 and dealt with the safety and health of child textile workers. Topic: <inaudible> Discrimination. Such laws prohibited discrimination against employees as morally unacceptable and illegal, in particular racial discrimination or gender discrimination. Topic. Dismissal Convention No. 158 of the International Labour Organization states that an employee "...can't be fired without any legitimate motive," and "...before offering him the possibility to defend himself." 
Thus, on April 28, 2006, after the unofficial repeal of the French First Employment Contract, the Longjumeu Conseil des Prud'hommes Labor Law Court judged the new employment contract contrary to international law and therefore illegitimate and without any juridical value. The court considered that the two years period of fire at will without any legal motive was unreasonable and contrary to convention. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Child labor. Child labor was not seen as a problem throughout most of history, only disputed with the beginning of universal schooling and the concepts of laborers and children's rights. Use of child labor was commonplace, often in factories. In England and Scotland in 1788, about two-thirds of persons working in water-powered textile factories were children. Child labor can be factory work, mining or quarrying, agriculture, helping in the parents' business, operating a small business, such as selling food, or doing odd jobs. Children work as guides for tourists, sometimes combined with bringing in business for shops and restaurants where they may also work. Other children do jobs such as assembling boxes or polishing shoes. However, rather than in factories and sweatshops, most child labor in the 21st century occurs in the informal sector, selling on the street, at work in agriculture or hidden away in houses. Far from the reach of official inspectors and from media scrutiny. Topic: <laughs> Collective labor law. Collective labor law concerns the relationship between employer, employee and trade unions. Trade unions also labor unions in the US are organizations which generally aim to promote the interests of their members. Topic: <laughs> Trade unions. Trade unions are organized groups of workers who engage in collective bargaining with employers. Some countries require unions and or employers to follow particular procedures in pursuit of their goals. For example, some countries require that unions poll the membership to approve a strike or to approve using members' dues for political projects. Laws may govern the circumstances and procedures under which unions are formed. They may guarantee the right to join a union, banning employer discrimination, or remain silent in this respect. Some legal codes allow unions to obligate their members, such as the requirement to comply with a majority decision in a strike vote. Some restrict this, such as, right to work, legislation in parts of the United States. In the different organization in the different countries trade union discusses with the employee on behalf of employer. At that time trade union discussed or talked with the manpower of the organization. At that time trade union perform his role like a bridge between the employee and employer. Topic. Workplace participation A legally binding right for workers as a group to participate in workplace management is acknowledged in some form in most developed countries. In a majority of EU member states for example, Germany, Sweden, and France the workforce has a right to elect directors on the board of large corporations. This is usually called, "...co-determination." And currently most countries allow for the election of one third of the board, though the workforce can have the right to elect anywhere from a single director, to just under a half in Germany. However, German company law uses a split board system, in which a supervisory board appoints an executive board. Under the Mitbestimmungsgesetz 1976, shareholders and employees elect the supervisory board in equal numbers, but the head of the supervisory board with a casting vote is a shareholder representative. 
The first statutes to introduce board level co-determination were in Britain, however most of these measures, except in universities, were removed in 1948 and 1979. The oldest surviving statute is found in the United States, in the Massachusetts Laws on Manufacturing Corporations, introduced in 1919, however this was always voluntary. In the United Kingdom, similar proposals were drawn up, and a command paper produced named the Bullock Report Industrial Democracy was released in 1977 by the James Callaghan Labour Party government. Unions would have directly elected half of the board. An independent element would also be added. However, the proposal was not enacted. The European Commission offered proposals for worker participation in the Fifth Company Law Directive, which was also not implemented. In Sweden, participation is regulated through the Law on Board Representation. The law covers all private companies with 25 or more employees. In these companies, workers usually through unions have a right to appoint two board members and two substitutes. If the company has more than 1,000 employees, this rises to three members and three substitutes. It is common practice to allocate them among the major union coalitions. Topic. Information and consultation Workplace statutes in many countries require that employers consult their workers on various issues. Topic. Collective bargaining Topic. Collective action Strike action is the worker tactic most associated with industrial disputes. In most countries, strikes are legal under a circumscribed set of conditions. Among them may be that the strike is decided on by a prescribed democratic process wildcat strikes are illegal. Sympathy strikes, against a company by which workers are not directly employed, may be prohibited. General strikes may be forbidden for example, among public safety workers, to maintain public order, a boycott is a refusal to buy, sell, or otherwise trade with an individual or business. Other tactics include go slow, sabotage, work to rule, sit in or en masse not reporting to work. Some labor law explicitly bans such activity, none explicitly allows it. Picketing is often used by workers during strikes. They may congregate near the business they are striking against to make their presence felt, increase worker participation and dissuade or prevent strike breakers from entering the workplace. In many countries, this activity is restricted by law, by more general law restricting demonstrations, or by injunctions on particular pickets. For example, labor law may restrict secondary picketing, picketing a business connected with the company not directly with the dispute, such as a supplier, or flying pickets mobile strikers who travel to join a picket. Laws may prohibit obstructing others from conducting lawful business, outlaw obstructive pickets allow court orders to restrict picketing locations or behaving in particular ways shouting abuse, for example. Topic. International labor law The labor movement has long been concerned that economic globalization would weaken worker bargaining power, as their employers could hire workers abroad to avoid domestic labor standards. Karl Marx said, the extension of the principle of free trade, which induces between nations such a competition that the interest of the workman is liable to be lost sight of and sacrificed in the fierce international race between capitalists, demands that such organizations unions, should be still further extended and made international. The International Labour Organization and the World Trade Organization have been a primary focus among international bodies for regulating labour markets. Conflicts arise when people work in more than one country. 
EU law has a growing body of workplace rules. Topic: International Labour Organization. Following World War I, the Treaty of Versailles contained the first constitution of a new international labor organization ILO, founded on the principle that, "...labor is not a commodity", and for the reason that, "...peace can be established only if it is based upon social justice." ILO's primary role has been to coordinate international labor law by issuing conventions. ILO members can voluntarily adopt and ratify the conventions. For instance, the first hours of work industry convention, 1919 required a maximum of a 48-hour week, and has been ratified by 52 out of 185 member states. The UK ultimately refused to ratify the convention, as did many current EU members, although the Working Time Directive adopts its principles, subject to individual opt-out. ILO's constitution comes from the 1944 Declaration of Philadelphia and under the 1998 Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work classified eight conventions as core. These require freedom to join a union, bargain collectively and take action conventions no. 87 and 98, abolition of forced labor 29 and 105, abolition of labor by children before the end of compulsory school 138 and 182, and no discrimination at work no. 100 and 111. Member compliance with the core conventions is obligatory, even if the country has not ratified the convention in question. To ensure compliance, the ILO is limited to gathering evidence and reporting on member states' progress, relying on publicity to create pressure to reform. Global reports on core standards are produced yearly, while individual reports on countries who have ratified other conventions are compiled on a bi annual or less frequent basis. Because the ILO's enforcement mechanisms are weak, incorporating labor standards in the World Trade Organization's WTO operation has been proposed. WTO oversees, primarily, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade Treaty aimed at reducing customs, tariffs and other barriers to import and export of goods, services and capital between its 157 member countries. Unlike for the ILO, contravening WTO rules as recognized by the dispute settlement procedures opens a country to retaliation through trade sanctions. This could include reinstatement of targeted tariffs against the offender. Proponents have called for a social clause to be inserted into the GATT agreements, for example, by amending Article 20, which provides an exception that allows imposition of sanctions for breaches of human rights. An explicit reference to core labor standards could allow comparable action where a WTO member state breaches ILO standards. Opponents argue that such an approach could undermine labor rights, because industries, and therefore workforces could be harmed with no guarantee of reform. Furthermore, it was argued in the 1996 Singapore Ministerial Declaration 1996 that, "...the comparative advantage of countries, particularly low-age developing countries, must in no way be put into question." Some countries want to take advantage of low wages and fewer rules as a comparative advantage to boost their economies. Another contested point is whether business moves production from high-wage to low-wage countries, given potential differences in worker productivity. Since GATT, most trade agreements have been bilateral. Some of these protect core labor standards. Moreover, in domestic tariff regulations, some countries give preference to countries that respect core labor rights, for example under the EC Tariff Preference Regulation, Articles 7 and 8. Topic. Work in multiple countries Conflicts of laws or private international law issues arise where workers work in multiple jurisdictions. If a U.S. worker performs part of her job in Brazil, China and Denmark a peripatetic 
worker, and employer may seek to characterize the employment contract as governed by the law of the country where labor rights are least favorable to the worker, or seek to argue that the most favorable system of labor rights does not apply. For example, in a UK labor law case, Ravat v Halliburton Manufacturing and Services Limited Ravat was from the UK but was employed in Libya by a German company that was part of Halliburton. He was dismissed by a supervisor based in Egypt. He was told he would be hired under UK law terms and conditions, and this was arranged by a staffing department in Aberdeen. Under the UK Employment Rights Act 1996 he would have a right to claim unfair dismissal, but the Act left open the question of the statute's territorial scope. The UK Supreme Court held that the principle would be that an expatriate worker, would be subject to UK rules if the worker could show a «close connection» to the UK, which was found in Rabat's case, this fits within the general framework in the EU. Under EU Roma Regulation Article 8, workers have employment rights of the country where they habitually work. They may have a claim in another country if they can establish a close connection to it. The regulation emphasizes that the rules should be applied with the purpose of protecting the worker. It is also necessary that a court has jurisdiction to hear a claim. Under the Brussels I Regulation Article 19, this requires the worker habitually works in the place where the claim is brought, or is engaged there. <laughs> EU law The European Union has extensive labor laws that officially exclude according to the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union matters around direct wage regulation e.g. setting a minimum wage, fairness of dismissals and collective bargaining. A series of directives regulate almost all other issues, for instance the Working Time Directive guarantees 28 days of paid holiday, the Equality Framework Directive prohibits all forms of discrimination and the Collective Redundancies Directive requires that proper notice is given and consultation takes place on decisions about economic dismissals. However, the European Court of Justice has recently extended the treaty's provisions via case law. Trade unions have sought to organize across borders in the same way that multinational corporations have organized production globally. Unions have sought to take collective action and strikes internationally. However, this coordination was challenged in the European Union in two controversial decisions. In Laval Limited v Swedish Builders Union a group of Latvian workers were sent to a construction site in Sweden. The local union took industrial action to make Laval Limited sign up to the local collective bargaining agreement. Under the Posted Workers Directive, Article 3 lays down minimum standards for foreign workers so that workers receive at least the minimum rights that they would have in their home country in case their place of work has low minimum rights. Article 3, 7, says that this shall not prevent application of terms and conditions of employment which are more favorable to workers." Most people thought this meant that more favorable conditions could be given than the minimum e.g., in Latvian law, by the host state's legislation or a collective agreement. However the European Court of Justice ECJ, said that only the local state could raise standards beyond its minimum for foreign workers. Any attempt by the host state, or a collective agreement unless the collective agreement is declared universal under Article 3 8, would infringe the business freedom under TFEU Article 56. This decision was implicitly reversed by the European Union legislature in the Roma Regulation, which makes clear in Recital 34 that the host state may allow more favorable standards. However, in the Rosella, the ECJ held that a blockade by the International Transport Workers Federation against a business that was using an Estonian flag of convenience i.e., saying it was operating under Estonian law to avoid labor standards of Finland infringed the business right of free establishment under TFEU Article 49. The ECJ said that it recognized the workers' right to strike. 
in accordance with ILO Convention 87, but said that its use must be proportionately to the right of the business establishment. Topic: <laughs> National labor laws. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Australia. The Fair Work Act of 2009 provides the regulations governing Australian workplaces and employers. Australia has a minimum wage and workplace conditions overseen by the Fair Work Commission. Canada In Canadian law, labour law refers to matters connected with unionized workplaces, while employment law deals with non-unionized employees. In 2017, Premier Brad Wall announced that Saskatchewan's government is to cut 3.5% from its workers' and officers' wages in 2018. This salary cut includes MLA ministers and the Premier's office staff along all people employed by the government. Unpaid days off, will also be implemented as well as limiting overtime to assist the wage cut. China In the People's Republic of China the basic labor laws are the Labor Law of People's Republic of China, promulgated on 5 July 1994, and the Labor Contract Law of the People's Republic of China, adopted at the 28th session of the Standing Committee of the 10th National People's Congress on June 29, 2007, effective from January 1, 2008. The administrative regulations enacted by the State Council, the ministerial rules and the judicial explanations of the Supreme People's Court stipulate detailed rules concerning various aspects of employment. The government-controlled All-China Federation of Trade Unions is the sole legal labor union. Strikes are formally legal, but in practice are discouraged. Topic. France In France, the first labor laws were Waldeck Rousseau's laws passed in 1884. Between 1936 and 1938, the Popular Front enacted a law mandating 12 days two weeks each year of paid vacation for workers, and a law limited the work week to 40 hours, excluding overtime. The Grinnell Accords negotiated on May 25 and 26 in the middle of the May 1968 crisis, reduced the working week to 44 hours and created trade union sections in each enterprise. The minimum wage was increased by 25%. In 2000, Lionel Jospin's government enacted the 35-hour workweek, reduced from 39 hours. Five years later, Conservative Prime Minister Dominique de Villepin enacted the New Employment Contract Addressing the demands of employers asking for more flexibility in French labor laws, the CNE sparked criticism from trade unions and opponents claiming it favored contingent work. In 2006, he then attempted to pass the first employment contract CPE through a vote by emergency procedure, but that was met by students and unions' protests. President Jacques Chirac finally had no choice but to repeal it. <laughs> India Over 50 national and many more state-level laws govern work in India. So for instance, a permanent worker can be terminated only for proven misconduct or habitual absence. In the Uttam Nakate case, the Bombay High Court held that dismissing an employee for repeated sleeping on the factory floor was illegal. The decision was overturned by the Supreme Court of India two decades later. In 2008, the World Bank criticized the complexity, lack of modernization and flexibility in Indian regulations. Indonesia 
Indonesia has three central acts concerning labor and employment in Indonesia. These are I Act No. 21 Year 2000 Concerning Trade Unions II Act No. 13 Year 2003 Concerning Manpower, and III Act No. 2 Year 2004 Concerning Industrial Relations Dispute Settlement. These acts encompass the reforms the labor laws underwent in 1998. At the time, the government, in collaboration with employers and workers' organizations established new laws that account for the future needs and interest of ensuring justice in the Indonesian society while keeping in line with international labor standards. Iran Iran has not ratified the two basic conventions of the International Labour Organization on Freedom of Association and Collective Bargaining and one abolishing child labor. Israel Japan Mexico Mexican labor law reflects the historic interrelation between the state and the Confederation of Mexican Workers. The Confederation is officially aligned with the Institutional Revolutionary Party the Institutional Revolutionary Party, or PRI. While the law promises workers the right to strike and to organize, in practice it is difficult or impossible for independent unions to organize. Sweden In Sweden many workplace issues such as working hours, minimum wage and right to overtime compensation are regulated through collective bargaining agreements in accordance with the Swedish model of self-regulation, i.e. regulation by the labor market parties themselves in contrast to state regulation labor laws. A notable exception is the Employment Protection Act which regulates employment contracts and extensive employees' rights to employment under certain conditions. Switzerland The labor law of Switzerland covers all standards governing the employment of some kind. The regulation of the employment by private employers is largely harmonized at the federal level, while public sector employment still prevails a variety of cantonal laws. In particular, the civil standardization is distributed to a variety of laws. Of greater importance, particularly the new Federal Constitution of 1999, the Code of Obligations, the Labor Code as well as in the public sector, the Federal Personnel Act. <laughs> United Kingdom The Factory Acts first one in 1802, then 1833, and the 1823 Master and Servant Act were the first laws regulating labor relations in the United Kingdom. Most employment law before 1960 was based upon the law of contract. Since then there has been a significant expansion primarily due to the equality movement. In the European Union, laws are either acts of parliament called statutes, statutory regulations made by a secretary of state under an act of parliament or case law developed by various courts. The first significant expansion was the Equal Pay Act of 1970. This act was introduced to bring about pay equality for women in the workplace. Since 1997, changes in UK employment law include enhanced maternity and paternity rights, the introduction of a national minimum wage and the working time regulations, which covers working time, rest breaks and the right to paid annual leave. Discrimination law has been tightened, with protection from discrimination now available on the grounds of age, religion or belief and sexual orientation as well as gender, race and disability. Um, 
Topic: <laughs> United States. The Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 set the maximum standard work week to 44 hours. In 1950 this was reduced to 40 hours. A green card entitles immigrants to work, without requirement a separate work permit. Despite the 40-hour standard maximum work week, some lines of work require more than 40 hours. For example, farm workers may work over 72 hours a week, followed by at least 24 hours off. Exceptions to the break period exist for certain harvesting employees, such as those involved in harvesting grapes, tree fruits and cotton. Professionals, clerical administrative assistants, technical, and mechanical employees cannot be terminated for refusing to work more than 72 hours in a work week. These ceilings, combined with a competitive job market, often motivate American workers to work more hours. American workers on average take the fewest days off of any developed country. The Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments of the United States Constitution limit the power of the federal and state governments to discriminate. The private sector is not directly constrained by the Constitution, but several laws, particularly the Civil Rights Act of 1964, limit the private sector discrimination against certain groups. The Fifth Amendment has an explicit requirement that the federal government not deprive individuals of life, liberty, or property without due process of law and an implicit guarantee that each person receive equal protection of the law. The Fourteenth Amendment explicitly prohibits states from violating an individual's rights of due process and equal protection. Equal protection limits the state and federal government's power to discriminate in their employment practices by treating employees, former employees, or job applicants unequally because of membership in a group, like a race, religion or sex. Due process protection requires that employees have a fair procedural process before they are terminated if the termination is related to a «liberty», like the right to free speech, or a property interest. The National Labor Relations Act, enacted in 1935 as part of the New Deal legislation, guarantees workers the right to form unions and engage in collective bargaining. The Age Discrimination in Employment Act of 1967 prohibits employment discrimination based on age with respect to employees 40 years of age or older. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act is the principal federal statute with regard to employment discrimination, prohibiting unlawful employment discrimination by public and private employers, labor organizations, training programs and employment agencies based on race or color, religion, sex and national origin. Retaliation is also prohibited by Title VII against any person for opposing any practice forbidden by statute, or for making a charge, testifying, assisting, or participating in a proceeding under the statute. The Civil Rights Act of 1991 expanded the damages available to Title VII cases and granted Title VII plaintiffs the right to jury trial. Topic: Halakha, Jewish religious law. The beginnings of halakhic labor law are in the Bible, in which two commandments refer to this subject: the law against delayed wages, Lev. 1913, Doi 2414-15, and the workers' right to eat the employer's crops, Doi 2325-26. The Talmudic law, in which labor law is called. Laws of worker hiring elaborates on many more aspects of employment relations, mainly in Tractate Baba Metzia. In some issues, the Talmud, following the Tosefta, refers the parties to the customary law. All is as the custom of the region postulates. Modern halakhic labor law developed very slowly. Rabbi Israel Mir Haykohen the Hafetz Hayim, interprets the worker's right for timely payment in a tendency that clearly favors the employee over the employer, but does not refer to new questions of employment relations. 
Only in the 1920s we find the first halakhic authority to tackle the questions of trade unions that could easily be anchored in Talmudic law, and the right of strike which is quite problematic in terms of Talmudic law. Rabbis A. I. Kook and B. M. H. Uziel tend to corporatist settling of labor conflicts, while Rabbi Moshe Feinstein clearly adopts the liberal democratic collective bargaining model. Since the 1940s the Halakhic literature on labor law was enriched by books and articles that referred to growing range of questions and basically adopted the liberal democratic approach. See also <laughs> <laughs> Notes <laughs>